Suave. I've been in my bag for a while, I'm invincible Story of a young boss, grinding shit critical Calling on my bros one time, cause you special I had some hood dreams and right rounds for my mentor Every target that I shoot is on point like a pencil Different routes change relationships, I'm so sorry Came up from the trenches and I made it, I say hardly now Bet Online continues to be the number one source for all of your basketball wager needs Including pro and college hoops throughout the year with up-to-the-minute odds, stats, and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in-game live betting, contests, and all the best player props. Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices. Head to Bet Online today to become part of the team and remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-B, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, the game starts here. All righty, guys. We are back with another episode of the What's in Your Bag podcast presented by Bet Online. I am your host, Andrew Robinson, and I am joined by my special, our special, special guest host, Alexis Davis, who just came back from covering the Super Bowl. So, Alexis, thank you for coming on with us today. Glad to have you. Yeah, so happy to be back, especially back in Phoenix because it was cold, windy, and rainy at the Super Bowl. For those that were there, they know I had to personally go out and buy a coat. So definitely a great experience, but happy to be back in sunny Phoenix. Yeah, and I'm liking the, the USA jacket you got going on over there too. Okay, I see your fits. I feel like I'm on a, you know how they be like a top Amazon bottoms thrifted. But yeah, so this is thrifted. Um, so yeah, go, okay. go get that. Love it, love it. <laughs> Now, before we introduce our wonderful guest for today, somebody who we're super, super excited and honored to have on the podcast, you know, we got to get the business out of the way. Guys, if you're hearing this on Spotify or Apple, go ahead and give us a five-star rating. Drop a comment, give us some feedback. It goes a long, long way. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you stop what you're doing. Go ahead and tap that subscribe button. It goes a long way in getting this show out to the people who need to hear the good gospel of the What's In Your Bag podcast. That was my guy, Pull Up Tay, on the intro. It's going to be him as well on the outro. Make sure you guys are streaming his music and showing my guy some love. One of the hottest up-and-coming artists out of the DMV. But without further ado, guys, as you can see, we have a special, special guest today. Somebody who me and Alexis are super, super excited to have on. Somebody who we're super honored to just talk to, pick their brain. Somebody who has a wealth of experience in the industry. We are pleased and honored to be joined by KJ Wright, who is the host and sideline reporter for the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, KJ, thanks for joining us today. I am so excited to chat. Yes, yes. So um, obviously the season is upon us. We're getting ready to get into the break with All-Star Weekend getting here coming up. So just talk to us about the season so far. What are your thoughts on this year? Obviously, it's been a little rough with the injuries and up and down with the Grizzlies, but what is what is you know your perspective been thus far of, of the season and just heading into All Star break? The season has been different. So I came in. I'm in my fifth season, so I came in like with Jaw, with Taylor, and we have had success all four years. So this year it's been obviously a lot different because we have one standing starter who's even like left, and so the storytelling is a lot more difficult. Like usually I, you know, like I host the team's podcast and it's like, Hey, we can talk about winning. We can talk about how much fun everyone's having. It's a little more difficult. It's a little more difficult this year. And so, uh, I was talking to, um, Natalie Kerwin, she's a silent reporter for the Detroit Pistons. And when they were going through that losing streak, the like 20 something game losing streak, we were talking about how if you can successfully report and keep your fans entertained during like really tough stretches and really tough seasons, then like you are going to be a better journalist for it. Cause imagine doing that and then covering a winning team. And so I'm just trying to look at it in a positive way. There are still things to talk about. Uh, it's just been harder. And I don't get to do walk-off interviews. We won like three games at home Four. Mm. Mm. Now nah, it's, it's definitely, definitely tough. Definitely tough. Mm-hmm. Now I always, one thing I always, I guess I'm, I'm intrigued to watch from the sidelines. Like when you guys are doing a little post game interviews and it's like, let's say it's a, a big time game winner or something. And you know, guys always come over with the water to try to splash the guys. Have you ever gotten caught in one of those uh, water tosses? <laughs> and do you see those coming from before? Like I'm always intrigued to see how you guys kind of dodge those sometimes. <laughs> yeah. The Grizzlies don't do water, um, but they, and they would tell you that they started the like mob after the game 
Yeah. They've been doing this for like three seasons now where like if someone has a really good game, like the whole team comes over and like mobs it. Like you've seen it when like Malika came here and she was interviewing Des. Like the whole team was like almost like, Rrr. and we've like, I've obviously had that, but also you get used to that. Like it's been three years now, but they, no, they've never, they've never watered anyone. I did see um, Brooke Olsendam, who's the silent reporter for Portland. She's been there like literally forever, like forever, forever. And I know every time that they go to like, I think like, let's say Dame last year, they'd like go to splash Dame with water. There'd be like one sweet little player that would like pull her out of the way before him. Like from behind, they'd be like, boop, just so you don't get wet. And then they pour. We <laughs> love that one player. You mentioned too how um, Detroit obviously went through that long, long stretch of not winning games and how you were able to rely on Natalie, who does like a great job with the Tigers, Pistons, just all things um, Detroit. I always wonder how she juggles like so many sports, especially because I feel like it's kind of hard to be an expert on every sport, but you're kind of expected to be when you have that mic. So kind of just how was it to be able to have that conversation and kind of already have that established relationship with her to kind of be able to talk to her and rely on her when the Grizzlies weren't doing as well? Because obviously, even if they're winning or losing, you still have an obligation to, you know, tell a good story. So how was it to be able to rely on her or someone else who's a team reporter to kind of just talk to you about what she did during that stretch? So one of the coolest parts of my job, at least I think, is that before every game 82 games and it's been I think we've been doing it for maybe this is my third season doing it I do like a 10 minute zoom call like we are right here um we record it and we put it on like YouTube and Facebook and social like Twitter um and I do it with the other team's reporter and so sometimes they don't have like a team reporter and I'll do it with like a beat writer but I do a 10 minute interview with someone from the other team and so I think that's really interesting because you get an insight into the other team, no matter what's happening, wins, losses, injuries, whatever. And then even better is that after you stop pressing record, you can like sit and actually have a conversation with the person off, you know, off camera technically. Um, and so I think the relationships that I've built over the last three years with every single team has been so nice. And then, you know, you like see them at the games when you're traveling and at different arenas. And so I think that's been so helpful in more than one way because sorry to uh our buddy over here but I always try and find a woman I always try I always try and get a woman um and it's just been really helpful with a lot of things so like even contract negotiations I have you know like 30 other girls that I can talk to about like is this normal like should an agent be taking 20 percent? should they be taking three percent like what are your what are you guys doing for I actually had this conversation with um Lauren Jabara just yesterday we were planning our women's day game, which is in March. And I reached out to her because I know that Atlanta was here last year. And I was like, what mm -hmm. did you do for women's day last year? Like you have these relationships where you can just rely on each other because there's only whatever, like 30, 30 of you. And so, yeah, it's been really special. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of my job is chatting with someone else before each game. Yeah, definitely shout out to Lauren now, you know, being on NBA TV and being mm -hmm. able to make that jump uh, to national. Just, you know, she was just so great when I met her in person. So just seeing her now on a national platform, just really like I remember I, last time I saw her, she was running um, to, up to a player and like all his family were around. So she had to do that job of saying like, hey, God, like literally he's talking to his mom like, hey, can you guys talk later? I have to interview him. So kind of like having to move his mom just definitely, you know, props to Lauren for that. Yeah. That's awesome, and trust me, guys. No, no offense taken. You know what I mean. All facts media. We're we're uh, we're, we're definitely in our women in sports era right now. As us can attest, man. We had Sydney on. Shout out to, I also give a shout out to Sydney and Casey because um, they both were advocating for us to get KJ on the show, and we made it happen. You know what I mean. They spoke very, very highly of you uh, on their episode. So um, we're we're honored to, to first of all have you on the show, obviously, but also just you know highlight the many women in sports that are doing amazing things, like. Alexis as well, which is why I'm glad to have her on the show because she keeps me on my toes always as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to get into your journey and, and your 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 past life almost before you got into the, the media lane uh, when you were the hooper, you know what I mean? And oh I think your, your hooping days have been well documented. I know you've talked about it a bunch, so I won't ask you to recap that. But what, the, the question that I have for you is, um, you know, your senior year at Ryerson, you had a very, very good year. I was almost 14 points per game, you know, 43 pointers. You had a all time, you know, record and made threes over a career, right? So it wasn't like you were just out there standing around, you know what I mean? You could really hoop. And I think one of the questions that I'm always curious about is 
what was that decision like for you to decide to put the basketball down? Because you mentioned that one of the main reasons why you decided to take that fifth year and do the master's program was because you were like, yo, I got one year left of basketball. Like I really want to continue playing, you know? So it was clear that you obviously had a love for the game. You were good at it. So did you ever contemplate playing professionally, like maybe either in Canada or overseas? Like, and then if so, like, or if not, what was that thought process like for you when it was like, hmm, do I want to continue this? Um, professionally, or do I want to kind of put the shoes down, throw them on the phone line, and go into my next career? Just what was that process like for you when you were making that decision? Uh, I don't think it was a decision. Like, eh, like any anyone who not anyone, I'll say, a lot of the time, if you are growing up in Canada and you're really good at basketball, you go D one, and so. I wasn't that good at basketball. I knew that I, I knew that it wasn't a professional thing for me. It was just, it was a passion of mine and it was a way to, for me to use basketball, you know, they, that old saying like use basketball, don't let basketball use you. And so it paid for my schooling of all five years. And it was a way for me to be financially stable in college. And it was fun. And I always liked the team camaraderie, but no, I wasn't like, I don't think there's very many girls who play Canadian basketball and then go pro unless you have like a European passport. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's no knock of Canadian basketball. I loved my five years there, but I'm not, I'm not competing with Kia nurse who, you know, went and won eight championships at UConn. So yeah. no, it wasn't really a decision. There's no professional basketball in Canada for women. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just not as many opportunities for women either like you have to remember like i'm older too so there's more opportunities now yeah back when i was there there was like barely a, a women's summer league to go play in like in the off season so yeah. not really a decision i always kind of knew that like after college like that was my peak in terms of like what basketball was going to be for me um and then at that point it was just how do i keep basketball in my life like in a way because again like at that time even when i graduated um like I didn't, I didn't get to play in summer leagues after that. I didn't get to like go to like a rec league. I would like try and go to the YMCA and play with some of my old teammates, but no boys want to play with you. And when they do, they don't actually play. So I don't know. I just, I kind of always knew even going into college, that was going to be what it was. Got you. Got you. Um, so I'm going to need you to confirm this, this story for me because I read this in an article. I read this in an uh -oh. article. Like, I was like, hold on a little, man. This, this is, this is the, if it's true, this is a testament of your dedication and, and your, your your willpower to kind of get into the industry. But so I read that um, after you were kind of trying to figure out, like, you know, get your foot in the door with the industry, um, you were trying to get a job at TSN. And mm -hmm. I read that you like knocked on the door of like the head guy at, at TSN's house or something, like every six months or something like trying to get a job. And eventually, like it paid off. You ended up meeting this guy and um, that kind of probably into opportunity to work the um, BioSteel Canadian game, which was like the Canadian All Star game um, over there, and it kind of kind of snowballed as like your big break into the industry with covering high school athletes, and then from there it's kind of like rest of history type type of thing. So I want to know. You make you me sound like a psychopath. I want that. That's what I read, and I'm like, okay, hold on. Is this like a physical like knock on the door? Like I need to, I need to, I need to get the insight into this into this story. Okay, so I definitely never like knew where anyone lived. Okay. I'm not a crazy stalker. I um I had some I just wanted to I wanted everyone to like know my name. So, I would send emails all the time, like cold emails like, "Hey, here's my demo. Hey, I live in Toronto. Hey, this is me." I would also send Christmas cards. Mm -hmm. Uh I, I had them made with like pictures of like me reporting. Uh, I would send those and you can just send them. You can find anyone's address. Like you guys can send me a card right now. You can find my work address, not home, like your office address. Anyone Don't tell can. me. I'm going to start Googling. <laughs> well, well, Valentine's Day is tomorrow. So Ooh. find my address, send some flowers. Uh, yeah, well, I would send Christmas cards. I would send emails like a lot. And to any email that I could find, uh, I was big into LinkedIn. I would reach out to people on LinkedIn all the time. Just ask them for coffee, ask them for advice. I ended up meeting with the, at that time, I don't think he works there anymore. At that time, the head of like TSN hiring. And I just asked him if, you know, like I could just come talk to you. Like, let me just have a little combo. And yeah, um, 
I ended up meeting him a couple times. We actually worked together uh, maybe last year or the year before on a new project that he has just as like a little side freelance thing because again, relationships are so important. So even when he was done with TSN, he reached out for me once I was here to like be a part of what he was doing now. And so that was really cool. The biosteel thing. So it would be the equivalent of like the uh, McDonald's All-American here. Mm -hmm. And so that... Again, it was a relationship thing. So I knew the guy who was ha like in charge of MBA TV Canada, and he still is. He's a great guy. And he was at this high school game that I was at, and he was like walking out. And in my mind, I saw a little light bulb, and I was like, I have to go chase him. Like, the. And so I like saw him walking. I like sprinted down the stairs, and I was like, Hi, Dwayne. I'm so happy you're here. I'm Kelsey. Like, I'm more than want to be involved. Like, I've been covering like these high school kids, like just covering their games on a volunteer basis. But I was like, I know them really well because I've been watching them all year. If you guys need information about them, if you want help making info packets, if you want to hire me. Uh, and then, yeah, so that relationship started. He took me on one of his shows. They do kind of like a panel type show. And he brought me on as one of the guests for one episode. I must have like done okay. And then, yeah, then the BioSteel Canadian game happened. I don't think he hired me that year. I think it was the following year they brought me on. Uh, and then I did that twice. Oh, that was so fun. That's like reminiscing because it's crazy. Those guys are like in the NBA now. Like yeah. Some of my first interviews at BioSteel was like Lou Dort. Like, that's crazy. I haven't thought about that in a while. Weird. Yeah. I'm old. <laughs> I think... Um... I think that just says a lot, though. You know what I mean? Even though you weren't actually at his door, stalker status, you know what I mean? I think um, the cold emails, like literally running across the gym to track somebody down. I feel like one of my favorite things about having this podcast is just hearing different people's perspective and stories on how they got to where they are. And I think the one common denominator that I've realized is that the people who make it places in life, like, they're not afraid to, like, put their pride aside. You know what I mean? Whether it's sending them emails. hear how I actually yeah. met, like, my mentor? Like the, the mm. woman who is still my mentor right now, she was selling clothes at the time she was working for Cleveland and she was selling clothes. Like a lot of us do. Cause like you wear your clothes once and then you're like, Oh, I'm done. She was selling clothes and I couldn't get Poshmark because I was in Canada. A lot of apps you just like can't get. And so I DM her on Instagram and I'm like, Hey, the calves are coming to Toronto. Like, could I buy these two pieces of clothing from you? And then maybe once I get them from you, we can go for coffee. And she was like, sure. Like, of course, of course, I'm going to sell my clothes. And of course you can take me for coffee. And so I ended up meeting her in downtown Toronto. I think I had to take a day off work to go see her, but I was like, I'm meeting this girl. And uh, yeah, we met, she met me for coffee. And then that year the Cavs played the Raptors in the playoffs. So they were back and forth like a lot. And I met up with her every single time she was in town and I kept picking her brain. And then She's been so kind to me ever since, but even since then she left the Cavs and she, at that time was like, Hey, you should contact this person because like my job's about to be like, they're going to have to fill my job. And then I went for that interview and I didn't get it. But then that guy helped me meet the people in Memphis. Like it's all just like a meet people and like, hopefully they can open doors for you or hopefully they can give you a piece of advice. And it did. And so I'm so forever thankful that I just wanted to buy some clothes. I say that all the time. Yeah. You mentioned you didn't get the Cavs job, but it still ended up leading to obviously you being in Memphis. So what, cause I know like sometimes obviously people say, like, oh, one door closes, another one opens. But like when you're in it and when you're dealing with rejection, it's kind of hard to like, you know, see that. And, you know, sometimes you have to give yourself that 24 hours to, you know, be sad. So like yeah. what kind of allowed you to get yourself together to still you know present well to be able to be prepared to take on that Memphis job and to not kind of wallow in not getting the cash job uh I freelanced for five four or five five years after I graduated college five years and in freelancing I'm sure you guys know like everyone's been freelancing sort of in this industry rejection is every day. I would be pitching stories. I would be pitching myself. I would be pitching, like, let me write something for your magazine. And like the amount of times that you get told no is 10 times more than you get a yes. But I always, like my mom always said this growing up, like it's one yes. So like the amount of times that I reached out to people, the amount of times that, you know, I asked people for coffee, like you just needed one. Yes. Like I need, I just need a Memphis to say yes. 
and that's it. It's one. Yes. So I think, I think my, I'm like very stubborn. I'm like very much a Capricorn. And so I don't think there was a plan B. And so all the rejection, I was like, okay, like, how can I build from this? And again, relationships are so important because that guy that I met in Cleveland, like even when they were here a couple of weeks ago, like I still went and got coffee with him. And it's not like a, let's get coffee. Cause I want you to help me with something in the future. It's coffee. Cause like you make genuine relationships and then those people not like, I don't even need him to help me moving forward, but like he has helped me in the past. And like those relationships don't go away. And this industry is so small. And I'm sure you guys know that. Like, I'm sure every, like, look at Sydney and Casey, like the industry is so tiny that I think if you're just like a good person and you get a billion no's, eventually you're going to get that one yes. And then everything's going to change. It's just, yeah. I don't know, positive poly outlook, I guess. No, a hundred percent. And I think for you, right? So I think the kind of segue into the next question that I had, like, you know, you mentioned freelancing and dealing with rejection and dealing with those no, 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 right? Like, um, but eventually you do get that yes, that like changes everything, you know what I mean? And for you, what was that like yes moment for you? Like when it's like, oh, I, I finally, I finally did it. Like I'm finally, I finally broke through. Like I read another article that was like, when you first started, you got laid off twice in the first year, like from 2014 to 2015, you know what I mean? And it's like, Jesus, layoffs, like, and then you finally get that, I, I, I finally did it. You know what I mean? Like, what was that big yes moment for you? Yeah. Oh my God. You really did your research. That gives me anxiety, like thinking about it. So I worked my, uh, again, relationships. It's so crazy. So right out of college, my, I had a college professor who worked at like one of the biggest newspapers in Toronto, the Toronto star. And I really liked him. And so we had a good little like relationship. Um, and so right after college, he, he called me or emailed me or however you did it back then. Cause I'm old as hell. He wrote me a handwritten letter on a stone and he was like, <laughs> Hey, uh, we're hiring some people for this new app that we're making. Like, I'd love for you to join the team. And I'm like, Oh, sure, of course it like paid next to nothing. And it was in a newspaper. Like I knew I didn't want to do that, but I was like, cool, a job in the industry, like dope. And then the app sucked <laughs> and I got laid off. Like the whole, like the whole newsroom got laid off. And that sucked, but um, not like a pity party. But at that exact time, like I think two weeks later, my mom ended up having to go to the hospital and she was in the hospital for like three or four months. And so I was laid off actually for like four months, but I could go be with my mom and I was getting severance. So it, it was fine. And then she, he called and he was like, hey, we actually need some people to come back. And so I ended up going back. And then a couple months later, they're like, hey, just kidding. The app still sucks. Everyone's gone again. That was a roller coaster that sucked. Um, but I truly believe everything happens for a reason. So I'm not bitter. It was fine. I got to take care of my mom. But then Memphis, um, so the Cavs job, the interview was whatever year it was. And then like I had to go that whole NBA season and then Memphis happened. And so that whole year I was doing like literally whatever to make money. I was teaching English online to Chinese children. So I was waking up like early as hell because of the time change. Yeah. Um, I was, oh my God, I was a ringside reporter for a hockey team. When I tell you guys, this is so embarrassing. And this is between us and your listeners. My <laughs> first game, I thought I knew, I thought I knew like hockey-ish, right? Like, I don't know, you score a goal. I sh I'm Canadian, so I should like know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had to text one of my girlfriends who's like a hockey girl. And I was like, what's a blue line? Like everyone keeps talking about this friggin' blue line. Like I'm about to do my first interview and I don't know what the hell a blue line is. Like, okay. So that was horrible. Um, but I was working hockey. I was doing in arena hosting for our football team. And I'm like, so not an arena, like, yay girl, but I was doing it. I felt like it was in the industry. So it was fine. Um, and then this Memphis job came up and I went through all the interviews. Like you, I was brought down to Memphis. We had this five hour interview with a bunch of different parts of the organization. I stayed the night here. It's the first time I was ever in Tennessee. Uh, and then I don't know how much you guys know about immigration, but at that time, your president had put a halt on immigration and so I got the job and I was so happy. Like that was my high. I was like, holy crap, I'm going to work in the NBA. This is insane. And then my visa got denied. And I was like, oh, and I had like, I had ended my lease in Toronto in my apartment. I had sold all my stuff and I was just sitting there like, oh, sick. Okay. So I can't go take the job because I don't have a friggin' work visa. And then a couple more months went by. We like started to try again. 
And I can't even go to the States. Like I have a trip planned with my parents and my dog parks too. Yeah. I have a trip planned with my parents. I like, can't cross the border because my visa had been denied. It was this whole thing. Uh, eventually we like redid it. My visa got approved and I moved down here, but I was late to my first season because my visa didn't get denied. So I feel like I had a couple highs and a couple lows, even with getting this job. So like I was super, super high. I was like, holy crap, they offered me the job. Look at me. And then like a super low, like I am going to jump off a, my patio, my high rise in Toronto because my visa got denied. And then another high when it finally got approved. Um, yeah, I don't know. That just gave me anxiety reliving that because my visa, I'm going to have to go do this whole process again next year. Eesh. So I wanted to ask you because when you were responding just now, it kind of just made me think of a bunch of different things. And you talk about doing the hockey and not knowing what the blue line is and kind of taking the 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 job as an arena host and just kind of pepping everybody up. And there was a bunch of jobs that you took along the way. And um, you mentioned in the previous interview how like um, – Ali Clifton, I told you, like, you know what, like, say yes to every job, you know, like, that was the best piece of advice that, that you could give. And I wanted to just ask you, like, you live that, you know, you mentioned talk, covering like chess and all these different crazy types of sports that you had to do to get to where you are now. And I feel like a lot of people will see what you do, right? And they'll see your job and they'll say, oh, well, she stands on the sideline and gets to talk to NBA players, big whoop, like, that's a cool job, but, you know, she just did because of whatever not understanding that like there were a lot of things that you did beforehand to prepare yourself that taught you different lessons that you took along the way that can allow you to be in the place that you are now. So can you just speak to that mentality a little bit about um, that saying yes to everything mentality and then how that has contributed to you, you know, being able to excel at the job that you have today? Yeah, it's so disheartening online. And I, um, I always say that social media is the worst place on earth. And I, I stand by that truly. Like people are so mean on Twitter and obviously I think every, especially women. And again, I'm sorry, she'll get it. Especially women um, just get like, oh, she has this job because she looks like this or she has this job because she did this. I'm like, oh, the amount of work that I put into this, like you said, it, I was covering chess, figure skating. I covered Wushu. Do you guys even know what that is? I had to learn Wushu. Yeah, exactly. It's a, uh, it's pretty much like a sport that's like half dancing, half like sword fighting. Like, yeah, I, um, that was a cool job though. I did, uh, like six world university games, which are like little mini Olympics. Mm -hmm. And so the amount of sports that I covered was insane, but like, I don't know what I'm talking about. I tried, I tried to learn wushu. But I don't know. Um, I was volunteering at, you guys don't, won't know what Rogers TV is, but it's like a local news channel. It was in a basement of some office building and I was just trying to get reps. Um, I tell people now when they ask me like for advice, I'm like social media, although it's the absolute worst place in the world is so good for just getting reps in front of a camera. You have tick knocked out, you have YouTube, just being able to like sit in front of a camera and like talk about sports is going to give you reps that we didn't have when I was in college. Like I did, I couldn't make a YouTube when I was in college. I didn't know what that was. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think reps are the most important thing in the whole wide world, because I look back at when I first graduated with my master's, I was sending my demo out and I was like, I don't get why people are not hiring me. Like I'm so good. And now I look back at that, like sweetheart you are so horrible I even look back at my first couple of podcasts when I came to Memphis five years ago like I was like oh my god I am the shit can I swear sorry I am so good you're good and then I look back at those now and I'm like <laughs> they're kind of they're kind of crappy uh and so obviously like reps 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 reps, reps you're always going to be growing and so if you say no to any opportunity you're saying no to growth is the way I looked at it no matter what sport it was no matter what like even when I was covering hockey like, obviously I don't like hockey and I don't want to be covering hockey, but it, I look at it as a way, like I, that grew me in reps one two, research. Like it made me a better researcher three. It, it taught me about different cultures of like athletes and sports because the hockey culture is very different from what I grew up in the basketball culture. And it made me more like kind of dynamic and how I ask questions and how I approach other people's and their personalities, like everything like helps you grow. So saying no to any opportunity is just saying no to your own growth. And I always felt like that would be kind of a waste. Yeah. Yeah.
I think too, like just looking at, you know, obviously everything that's gone on with John Moran over the past couple of seasons, et cetera. I think for me, like one of the questions I have is the way you might cover that is different than how, you know, the beat reporter from the commercial appeal might cover that situation. So I guess like as someone that is a, I guess you could say team employee, what were some things that you get, I guess, because I think for me too, like, even though like I'm a team employee, there's still stuff, but I'm a journalist. So there's still stuff that happens that I'm curious about or that, you know, I want to cover, et cetera, but there's still like a certain PR angle you have to spend to it, et cetera. So just, I guess, what were some things that you had to work through when you were covering everything that was going on with him? My job is to make our guys look good. Mm-hmm. just straight up my job is to make sure that people don't forget that these athletes are human beings and have lives and have families and have interests outside of basketball and it's my job to highlight that for the world and John Morant although he is this global superstar is a guy is a regular guy who loves his daughter who makes mistakes, just like all of us make mistakes. It's just amplified because he's an absolute superstar. And so I don't think anything changed in my job. Uh, in fact, it actually probably made it easier because I it, like jaw since I got here, gave me a spotlight for my work to shine. Every podcast I've ever done with him, every interview I've ever done with him gets more eyes than any other interview that we do because he's so um, big. He's so famous, but also he makes it really easy because I came in with him when he was a kid. Like we've grown together over the past five years. And so he trusts me and we've grown our relationship. And I know, I know his family, I know his his friends. And so it's easy for me to be like, I know who jaw is these people out here in social media, in this world, they don't know who jaw is. So it's my job to show everyone that he's actually a really, really good human being. And you all made mistakes when you were 22 as well. And uh, yeah, I don't think it changed anything for me. It just, it, it highlighted that people, even journalists, like don't, don't know these athletes the way that we have access to them. And so just keep on doing my job. I hope that I, I hope if I could change two people's opinions or highlight the fact that these athletes are human beings to two people, then I feel like I did my job. Yeah, that's, I think that's a great perspective. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, people are, are quick to villainize people on the internet and form these opinions. So I think it's valuable to have people like yourself who can show people in, in a positive light and in the off the court light that will make them um, a little bit more relatable and understandable to, to everybody. But I wanted to ask you because speaking of Ja and speaking of this whole social media thing, right? Um, it was a little meme or picture that had went viral recently with you interviewing Ja at a game this season. I think the caption was like, oh, Ja has elite eye discipline or something like that because he was like, they're like straightforward. And it's like, I feel like a lot of times, I Taylor Rocha talked about this, um, a plethora of just people commenting on, your body or your looks and things like that. So when you see things like that, and you mentioned social media is like the worst place on the, in in the world, like how does how do those comments from people on social media or does that affect you from doing your job or how you prepare to do your job or how you may think about how you're going to dress for the job? Like how does how does those things that people make comments like that um, affect you on a day to day basis or how do you guys deal with that to continue to show up the way you are and and you know do your job to the best of your ability? I didn't leave bed for two days. It was actually really hurtful. And there were so many people that were reaching out to me in like a kind hearted, like nice way. Like they'd be like, Hey, I saw your picture. Like you're going viral. I'm like I'm going viral for like, not the right thing. You know, like it's no, it's no one being like, Hey, check out her work. Hey, she's worked hard to be here. It's like, Hey, she has big boobs. The players all must want to look at them. Like it was, it was actually so offensive. Yeah. Um, I hated that a lot. Uh, it, it's rolled over now. And I know that the news cycle is like a few days. And in the end, it like will be helpful. Again, it's eyes. And like, hopefully people followed me because of that, which I hate. But now they're following me. And now I can show my work to people. Um, but no, I hate it. I hated every second of that. 
every single second of when that was happening. It was like a week long. And Jaw ja actually apologized to me. Like that breaks my heart too. Like, I just don't think people understand that they're like, you can be professional and look good. I don't know. I, I never understood the, like the, oh my God, she, and this is not even just she, like anyone is not doing her job good because she's wearing a dress. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm still trying to uh, process everything. Yeah. Still, it's still a fresh wound. Yeah. No, I would sure. say like back when the days when you were, you know, sending out those demos, doing, you know, well, you still are doing other jobs outside of Grizzlies, obviously. But back when you were like really trying to get that first, like, okay, how would you say the way women dress have has kind of, I guess you say evolved, like the way that women dress on air? Because I feel like, you know, a couple of years ago, it was navy blue suit, like you have to look like, you know, or like the the dresses that come down to the ankles and like the three quarters, like it really was like that. And if you don't show up this way, like a heel boot would have never like flown. So like, if you don't show up this way, then obviously you're not ready to take it on. But now it's, you know, it's the pink pants suits. It's the white heel. It's the, you know, you can really do whatever you want. And when you show up that way, besides, you know, whoever was commenting on that picture with you and job, but people don't look and say, oh, she has a pink suit. There's no way that she's prepared to do this. So how would you say like, just the way that women dress on air, like how would you say like that's kind of evolved from when you were, you know, fresh out of your master's degree? Yeah. I mean, I fell victim to that as well. I know when I was in college and also your professors tell you to dress like so stupid mm -hmm. uh <laughs> I think there was like this this stereotype's not the right word but like this standard of dressing and I think that went for women like across like not just sports like news sports weather everything that was like this is how you have to be to be professional this is what you have to be to work in a man's field you have to dress like like a man, like a suit, you know? Um, and I think, I think just women in general have evolved and that's helped the empowerment movement. I think there's different body types now. I think there's different skin tones now. And I think you're almost encouraged to like be yourself instead of trying to be someone else. Like I know when I first got into this, I was definitely trying to be someone else. I was trying to like, I was 20 something and I was dressing old as hell. You're trying to be what you can see instead of just being you and then just using your brain and your mouth to be prepared. And I think a lot of the time back then, like young girls would see women, oh, my computer is about to die, would see women um, and be like, okay, she's wearing a suit, so I have to wear a suit. It doesn't matter how much I know. It doesn't matter how prepared, how much work I put in. No one's going to take me seriously unless I'm in my three-piece suit. And now I think women have, have become less of like a, oh my God, they have a woman on their broadcast team more as like a, oh, there's a broadcaster who just happens to be a woman who the hell cares what she wears. She like what she's saying is more important. And I think, I don't know. I think, I think it's come from normalizing just women in the space period, you know? And, and it's also, I don't know, there was this like, very like structured this is who a silent reporter is or this is who an analyst is like we have women analysts now and now it's this could be this is an this is a silent reporter she just happens to be a girl and she's dressing for her body type like if you put me in a suit I promise you I will I will not I will not look good like it's just that's that's the way my body is I just I would be busting out of it like it's just not gonna happen and so I don't know I I think just normalizing that like you are your position and you happen to be a woman has changed the way that everyone looks at having women in the space. Yeah, I think too, just to add, like for me, like I used to try to wear those dresses and the heels and like, you know, the only the closed toes, the little heels with the dress. And I feel like when I was in that, 
in a way it's supposed to empower you to do better. But to me, I felt like when I was wearing that versus like, I'm literally going to work in this after, after we're off, I'm going, and I feel great. This is my first time wearing this to work. I know people are going to comment. I'm excited to wear this to work. But I and feel you like- you don't have that wearing, imposter syndrome being like, I'm dressing yeah, like- that. Yeah, and I feel like when I would wear the dress, it's like, I, I almost would perform at a lesser level because I feel like when I'm wearing what I want, I just feel so good to take on the day. Like, this is my first time going back to work in a week because I was in Vegas for Super Bowl and I was dreading it. But then once I put on what I wanted to put on, I'm like, oh, after we get off this dress, after we get off this podcast with KJ, I'm going to have a great, you know, shift at work. We're going to make some great content at Mercury and we're going to have a great day because I'm wearing what I want to wear. So I definitely do think like wearing what you want is like really important. They say look good, feel good. Perform. That's a real thing. Yeah. yeah. Play, good. Play good too. You know what I mean? You walk in the arena with the good tunnel drip. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, no, I think that's a great point. And I think that kind of also segue into my next question because um, kind of on the same, just working attire, a social media kind of thing, right? Recently on your Instagram, I saw that you've um, outed or exposed this one, this one fellow uh, because, and we won't say what he said because we're not going to give this 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 person the time of day. But he made a very mean comment in your DMs, and uh, you posted on your story like, "I got time today." Like, you know, you're not about to how you how can you have this in your bio? And then say something like this in my DMs, you know what I mean? Like it's crazy. And I feel like me as a man, like reading that, I, I like cringe on the inside. Comes like, yo, like men are unhinged. Like I don't understand how people can send these type of things. I can show you my DMs. I get thousands of those DMs. I was just honestly, I was kind of bored. I had so many of my friends be like, um, what the hell? Oh my I had, God. Sorry. I had so many of my friends be like, delete it. Like, don't let them get to me. I'm fine. No, uh, I, like, what, what, I, that's what I kind of wanted to ask. What made you like, no, I'm posting this. Like, I think people need to see this. You know what I mean? I think it's important that people do see the reality of the nasty things that people say um, in the DMs behind the privacy of, oh, they're not going to expose me or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, Sorry. Um, I think that people... I think that people send DMs not knowing that, again, this comes back to like not knowing that I'm a real human being. Yeah. And I think people send mean DMs to get a reaction out of you. So I probably shouldn't have posted it. And I think people send mean DMs because they think that I'll never see them. But I read all my DMs, you little psychos. I have lots of free time. People are crazy. I don't, I, I don't understand. I don't want, if I was in a different industry, if I was like a scientist, I would never have social media. I actually hate it here. Yeah, it's tough. But what I guess what if you could say send a message to I guess maybe somebody who's listening to this that um people that don't really understand like what you guys go through or I guess a message to the men out here who might send these crazy DMs like what would you say to people um who choose to be nasty and negative on social media to people that they don't even know? I don't know if I have a message. I, I don't know, like, why? Like, for, like, what do you get out of it? Like, for what? Unhinged behavior. Unhinged behavior. Unhinged <laughs> behavior. I think my, one of my coworkers said it best. He was like, does at anyone you know, anyone you're friends with, would they go on Instagram and leave nasty comments? And I was like, no, my friends aren't psychos. And he was like, okay. So the people in your, in your, dms in your comments saying really mean things like you can publicly people if you go to that picture of john i publicly people say really mean things none of no one that i know would do that and i know a lot of people yeah. and so the people that are doing it are not like right in the head like if no one you know would go out of their way to do that then like who are these people and like what do they have going on in their life that it would you would let it affect you you know but but you would never do that Never, never, never. No, a normal person wouldn't. Facts. And kind of on that same token, I feel like, so for me, right, just a little context, I'm getting ready to, I've been playing overseas for like four years. So I've been to a bunch of different countries, like playing basketball and stuff. And I recently had to get my visa to go to Japan. It took like, I think two months for it to get approved. I ended up missing the beginning of my season. So I, I know the struggle of like getting these visas for these countries. And um, you mentioned how like the Grizzlies, right? When you first got your opportunity, right? It took like seven months for you to get your visa finally approved. They got denied once and it's $15,000, right? For, you know, you to get that visa, you know? And it's like, when I was hearing that, I think 
you mentioned on a, a previous podcast, you were like, yo, at the end of the day, the Grizzlies are hiring, right? And it's KJ, and it's her circumstances, and it's another girl that's in America, they're going to hire her because I don't got to pay $15,000. I don't got to wait seven months for her visa. And when I heard that, it was like, yo, that just tells you how much the Grizzlies valued her and wanted her. And was like, no, like we're going to put up with the seven months visa. We're going to pay the 15000 for her to be a part of the team because they saw your – work and they saw what you could bring to the team and they saw like you know like we don't care how many miles away she is or the visa like we, we want her to be a part of our team and our family and i think that that says a lot about you as a person like not the way you look not any of that but just your work you know what i mean and for me and Lexus, as somebody who people who obviously look up to you and respect your work i think it's important for people to understand that as well because it's a lot that says a lot from a a, a company standpoint that they're willing to undertake those things for, to bring you uh, apart. You know, I think that if I can say one thing to the audience is like, understand that this is a, she is not one of them. You know what I mean? Like the work speaks for itself. And I kind of wanted to ask you, what did that mean to you that the Grizzlies were, were able to, you know, put all that to the side and say, Hey, like not nah, KJ, like despite what you have going on with the visa and you're in Canada and the 15 bands, like you're going to drop it for you to be a part of a team. Like what did that mean to you that they, decided to bring you a part of the team despite all of that. Yeah, I think we also got spoiled too because the Grizzlies uh, came from Vancouver. And so a lot of like the very, very higher ups uh, are also from Canada. So like my direct boss is from Canada, the head of like, I don't really know what her title is. She's the head of basketball operations is also from Canada. And so they had been through this whole process before. Um, and so I think I got very spoiled in that sense. But you also look at... Um, Look at someone like Megan McPeak, who is, she works for Washington. Uh, she's Canadian. And from the sounds of it, like when I was first getting my visa, it sounds like it was like a non-issue. And so I think uh, if you like find a talented person, you would do anything to bring them down. I don't know. I think I always thought I got spoiled, but then more and more women are coming to, to America after me. And so I think, I think Canada just has a lot of really talented people. And we only have one team, so we're trying to spread out. Yeah. I know some people, like, they don't really like to talk about money, finances, and brand deals, and the money. You know, anytime you bring up money, people are kind of like, eh, let's stay away from that. But I guess, you know, if you're comfortable answering, early on in your career, you know, you're going from freelance job to freelance job. You're getting laid off, and, you know, you don't really know. It's not like every two weeks, you know, every two weeks a month, you know, you're going to get this paycheck, et cetera. So what were some things, I guess you could say, to not just young women, but just people in general that are starting out, for instance, like for someone that might have to go to local news where they're only getting paid 30000 for a year contract, that, that's a real thing. So like, what what were some things that I guess that you did early on to kind of budget your money? Because I kind of think for women, it's a little bit harder. Um, I guess I could be biased, but I think for women, it's a little bit harder because Yes, you have to budget, but you still have to have your hair done. You still have to, you, you have you, in your head, you think you need a new outfit for everything, even though you really don't. But like every time you're on air, you think you got to buy a new outfit. Every time you're going to Super Bowl, you think you got to get, you got to buy a new outfit for each event that you're going to. So like, I guess early on, what were some things? Yeah, your nails, like full set is $90 these days, like even if you're going short. So it's just like, what were some things, <laughs> what were some things early on that you did as a woman to kind of budget? Because obviously, Obviously, the stability is just like this. I hate that you asked me this because I think I'm probably the worst person to ask because I ha I don't budget. I'm a, I'm I live life on the edge. <laughs> uh, I uh, no I okay, but I I was also like I was like very much more low maintenance. Like I have never dyed my hair. I didn't get my nails done. I would like paint them before, like I didn't want chipped paint. So I would just like paint them myself before I would go on air. Um, oh my God, this is so bad too. And again, I don't think I've ever told anyone this. When I used to do, ah, when I used to do um, March Madness hits, they were hits for like 30 seconds on TSN or on uh, like, TSN has like a news station as well that would do like a little piece of sports. Mm -hmm. And it was right across the street, like literally right across the street from a winners. Do you guys know what winners is? Kind of like TJ Maxx. Okay. TJ Maxx ish. Yep. And I would go and I would buy a shirt and I would wear it on the air and keep the tag on and then take it back. You would take it back. I don't, I don't advocate for that, but I did that. I did that 
I do that a lot. I was like, I'm wearing it for 30 seconds on air. That's so bad though. Don't do that. Well, Don't do that. No, if it makes you feel any better, I wasn't, I was talking to Andrew earlier about how I had to buy a coat when I was at the Super Bowl, but in my head, I really did not want to buy the coat because it's so hot in Phoenix. Like, I don't want to have the coat and the tag is still on the coat. And when I get off, it's already in the car and it's going back to Forever 21. I don't care. Literally, because I'm not going to wear the coat. Like, I, and then for me, I didn't pack one because it's never cold, rainy and windy in vegas but it was and i was working outside on a set and i was like i'm just gonna buy this coat everyone be careful around me do not spill shit on this coat because it's going back when i get back to phoenix i don't need a coat like it's, it's warm okay, so we've all we've all done this yeah, we've all been there so don't feel any shame that coat is still going back and in three to five business days it will be back in my account and it's in good condition someone else can buy it <laughs> y'all are hilarious yeah. i've actually never done that but y'all y'all might put me on some game i might well, go to <laughs> the way I look at it is when you have a stylist, they return a lot of clothes. So technically, you're just being your own stylist. You're just. I love that. So you know what? I'm I'm going to All Star Weekend this week, so I might gotta go to Indian and <laughs> real quick yeah. and keep the keep the tag on for the flicks. Hey, so are you going so to All Star this year? Oh, uh, boohoo! Dang. <laughs> Well, you know what? It's okay. I'll still take the 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 piece the, the tips that you guys are y'all giving out free game, right? Would you buy some questions? I feel like I cut you off. You buy a question? Oh no, I was gonna ask. You mentioned having a stylist, and I um, how like would you say like now? Do you still buy your own clothes for being on air, or like do you have a stylist? Like how do you prepare your on air? I guess appearance. I buy my own clothes. I am like so not into renting, even though sometimes these girls come to town and I'm like, oh my God, I love what you're wearing. They're like, rent the runway. I'm like, shit, you guys look really cute. Just not for me. Again, I think it's just my, I, I know how to dress my body. I don't have like a regular body. And so I, I feel weird like renting and then I'd have to alter and it's just not for me, but it looks great on a lot of girls. I buy my own clothes and again, relationships. Uh, we had a player named Kyle Anderson who was here my first and second year, maybe. Oh, no. And you get, to, you know him? I worked out with him back in high school when we were preparing for the draft. Yeah. He's a great human being. Um, he was here. And so I got to know his family. Maybe he's here for three years. I don't know. I got to know his family really well. And because they're always sitting courtside and like, whatever. You just, you know, people's families just because they're there. And when he left, um, his sister had reached out to me and she was like, I'm really going to miss you. Like, please stay in touch. Like, once a grizzly, always a grizzly. And I'm like, girl, yes, I love you as well. I'll miss you a ton. And then I um, went to New York and like, we went out together and we like, I never like, I never like fraternize when they're on the team. Cause I feel like that's weird. I'm friendly. But then when he was gone, I was like, oh, Brit, like we could be friends now. And uh, she's a stylist. And so now she will send me like, hey, buy this. Like there was one, she sent me this Forever 21 jacket, like very like something that, is affordable. I think it was like $40. And it was this like big fur white and blue jacket. And she was like, wear this, wear this with these pants and this shoe. And like it popped off. And all she's asking for is like a tag because she's trying to grow her business as well. And like even uh last week, I was like, what shoes should I wear with this outfit? And she was like, not those ones. Cause she like knows, but because I'm friends with her, like all she's asking for is a like recognition. And so it's really easy. It's a good little partnership. She'll send me like, hey, this dress would look good on you. And I'm like, thanks, Britt. I'll tag you. Yeah. So Brittany is awesome. She, I would consider her like my stylist, but yes, I just buy my own stuff and hope it's fine. Shout out to Britt. Shout out to Britt. I wanted to ask you because you, we've mentioned kind of a couple of people who have influenced you, like Ali Clifton, and you have mentioned how relationships are so important. Um, I'm wondering like today, right, when you are, in the position that you are today, like even you mentioned like dealing with the whole job situation, it was tough, you know what I mean? Like on your mental and like you were still dealing with that. So like today for you, who are some women that you rely on today um, to kind of support you or uplift you or some women that um, are just a part of your community and tribe that um, I guess you lean on in, in times like that? Because I think community is important and especially in this industry, you know, it's important that you have people that you can, you know, help out along the way or a show to the crime or a phone call, you know what I mean? So who are some of those people that, have become a part of your your tribe and your community um at for KJ today. How long do I have? <laughs> well Casey's one of my best friends. I know you guys talk to her, right? Yep. Casey's one of my best friends. I could call her crying and I know that she would like drop everything and chat with me. 
Um, Allie is still one of my biggest mentors. I talked to her just last week for like an hour about like agent stuff. Um, man, the, I could go on forever. I have really good women in my corner. Uh, Ashley Shamadi with Charlotte has been a really, really good friend. Lauren Jabara was a really good friend. We talked a lot about agent stuff a couple of weeks ago when she was here. Like I, Lachina Robinson has always been someone that I look up to a lot who helps me with demos. Like, I don't know. I could go on and on and on and on and on. I'd say that the, I like truly mean this. Oh, Amanda Flugrad helped me with her agent stuff as well. I would say the, the, I hate the word sisterhood. I really do. But like the camaraderie of the women in this position, just because there are so few of you, like less than, I guess, three dozen, right? Like less than 30 like you know what each other go through and so it's so easy to bond over that because there's not a lot of people who are going to understand like why I'm upset that a picture of myself went viral like there's just not a lot of people who like get the relationship between player and interviewer I don't know I just feel like the the third the less than 30 of us I I would call any one of them right now and be like drop everything I need to talk I am feeling down and I think that's a really special relationship to have yeah yeah i guess too like when you talk about the small group of you all that are you know either team reporters or you know i feel like different teams call it different stuff um yeah, like digital digital, reporter, like yeah, team yeah. digital hosts like yeah. it's, it's all in a, in a nutshell the same thing so like with so many women coming up now that you know want to want to essentially be um team reporters how do you and when you've been Memphis's team reporter for so long, how do you make sure that you kind of stay in the moment and just like remain grateful for the job that you have? Because there's so many women who would love that are in this field that are either looking to get out of local news and do something more like a, what you're doing. There's so many, and you know, the people in undergrad that look at you all, they're like, oh my God, they're living. This is the dream that I want to have, et cetera. So how do you, I guess, being that you are in that position, just remember to wake up every morning, being grateful, you know, not being lazy, not taking shortcuts. Just how do you kind of st just stay on your toes when there's so many, not necessarily not want to take your spot, but just are longing for what you have. So like, how, how do you kind of just make sure that you're staying grateful for where you are? That's such a good question. Like literally such a good question because there are days and I shit you not, like it happened last night. I like, it was halftime and I was like, holy shit, we're getting our asses kicked. Like, I want to go home. Like, this is, and literally, I kid you not, again, my best friend was sitting beside me because I brought her to the game and she was like, you're for real right now? Like, you're getting paid to watch this NBA game? Like, stop. And I think so many times I have to slap myself in the face and remember, like, when you guys just asked me about my, like, oh my God, yes moment. Like, I think you have to remember, like, everything that I've ever done has led up to this. Like I'm so lucky and I genuinely love my job. Like I have a meeting in 20 minutes. Like I'm not dreading going into work. Like I, I genuinely like love the people I work with. I have nothing bad to say about them. I love my team. I love the work that I do. And I think sometimes I think, I think you can get like semi complacent in anything in life. Like I, you can get semi complacent in a relationship until one day you're like, man, we haven't gone out on a date in a while. Like let's re-spark thing. I think that's natural, but I do. I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy you asked that because it happened last night and I had to like, literally like punch myself in the face. Like you're not serious right now. Like you're absolutely not serious because if whatever, six years ago, I would have looked at myself and been like, Kelsey, like you're literally working in the NBA. Like you're doing what you want to do. I would be like, Oh my God, I'm so happy. And I think sometimes it is easy to take anything for granted and it is like a little reminder every time, like, again, like I told you guys, I read all my DMs. I get DMs from young girls in college being like, Hey, like, I really look up to you. Like, can we have advice? And like those little moments I think are the, like the spark and the reminder. Like I, like I used to do that. I used to reach out to people cause I wanted to be them. And so I think those are the little reminders that are important to bring yourself back down. You're like, I'm, I'm getting paid to watch basketball right now. If we lose, I don't have to do anything. Cool. I get to watch this game. Oh no. Tough life. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I feel like, so I know you're short on time. So I ask you um, one, one more question and then we'll have some quick hitters and then we'll get you out the door. Um, so 
I wanted to ask you, like you, you mentioned, right. I think it's a perfect segue as well. You mentioned how far you've come and, you know, this dream job you have now, right? Like at this point in your life, what would you say is, is next for you? Right. If you could have like, you know what, 10 years from now, right. If I could be doing this, like, man, like, you know, if you still, like, what, if you still have a dream job, that's like, you know what I mean? Like, how do you kind of process what's next? Like, where do you want to go from here? Because at the end of the day, like, there's still so much ahead of you. There's still so much to be done. There's still, like, a lot of, you know, I'm sure everybody has dreams and aspirations for, you know, the future. So when you look at just everything you've accomplished up to this point, you know, where you started, all the long hours and odd jobs that you've done up to this point, you know, what would you say is next, you know, for you in your next chapter or, I guess, next phase? Funny you asked that too, because I think what four days ago I was having this conversation with Taylor, uh, you know, Taylor Rooks, everyone knows Taylor Rooks. That was stupid. Um, I was having this conversation with Taylor and just, I think to la like the beginning of last year, she helped me move my podcast from audio to video. And then we had this conversation because she was reaching out being like, how's it going? Which also she's so amazing at, like, she is one of the people who will like reach out unprompted to be like, Hey, how's this specific thing like she's so great anyway uh she was like what is like the next thing like we moved audio to video so like what's next and yeah. I was sitting there like I don't know I don't know what's next like I I I'm very happy with where I'm at right now I know that there is like a next step there's always more that you want to accomplish and again I'm very Capricorn so I'm very like work ambitious uh but I don't know I wish I could answer that question. I don't know. I don't know what's next. I don't know if, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know I'm this far. I don't even know if I like, my podcast is one of my favorite things that I do. I don't know if I go down a podcast route or if I go down like a more like Lauren Jabara route. I don't know. I don't know. That's the beauty of life though. That's the beauty of life yeah. is just letting it flow. And I think when you arrive, wherever that next chapter is, you'll be right where you're supposed to be, you know? Um, but before we get you out the door, we got some quick hitters for you. Have a little bit of fun. And uh, right. so first one that we got for you is, and you got to answer this. All right. No, no cop outs. Okay. Favorite Grizzlies player to interview. Jaron Jackson Jr. And why? He is a big kid. He's so fun. He's super goofy. He can just be himself. And again, we've been together for five years now. So he's just comfy and funny. Okay. Okay. Life on the line, you have one call to make to save your life and the person got to pick up for you to survive. Who on the Grizzlies are you calling? <laughs> Who is the most reliable? I would call, oh, if X was still here, we just got rid of him last week. I would call him. <laughs> I would call... I would call Luke Kennard. Mm, he seems reliable. He seems like a reliable person. Yeah. Yeah. And I think his, his wife is about to give birth. So I feel like he's he's not like sleeping. You know, he's like always on edge. So I feel like he'd be up. So like. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's so funny to say like somebody gives like reliable vibes. But go ahead. <laughs> no, I said that because my so I have a fun fact because I have a twin brother. His name is Aaron. And uh, he worked for the Clippers last year. So Luke was on the Clippers last year. And my brother was telling me how, like, him and Luke would go to, like, LMU games together. And, like, he was such, like, a Luke goes everywhere. Luke goes to high school basketball games. He's yeah. everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was, like, a super down-to-earth person. Like, it was it was super cool. He was, like, when he got traded from the Clippers, he was, like, one of the first years he going to miss, like, the most when he left. Um, yeah. was, that's fair. All right. Favorite restaurant on Beale Street? Uh, okay. Well, actually, no disclaimer. So... I I interned in Memphis, so I know like a lot of the great food spots are not. Like, that's why I knew like the commercial. Uh, Bill. They're not on Bill, so okay, you don't oh, have to. Say oh, on Bill Street, though. My neighborhood is top tier. Don't play with it. Okay, well, I'm not on Bill Street. That's not on. That's not on Bill Street. No, oh, I thought it was. Woo. But, so I guess just in Memphis, I guess to bear, to to phrase the question better just in memphis in general like either like a hole in the wall place or like just your go-to like i really want to pay for some good food where are you going uh amelia jeans it's across the street from me it's attached to the hotel that the visiting teams stay in and it is you walk in and you like feel like you're in new york and the food is unreal it's brand new but i love it okay <laughs> it's close yeah. to Beale. it's one block away from Beale. 
if that helps. Okay. Okay. Bet, bet. Um, all right. So you're styling yourself for Grizzlies game. Give us the fit. It was, you know, I know you're, you're, you're a fashion girly. So give us. I have give, to fit right here. Ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> for the fit. Okay, I have tomorrow's fit right here. I'm going to be quick. I just ordered it from Abercrombie. The tags are still on, but I'm not taking it back. I just got it. Okay. We, we, we believe you. I have this little silk skirt. It has shorts under it. Beep. We love a short. Okay. Okay. And Abercrombie again. I've never ordered from Abercrombie like since high school, but apparently they have really nice stuff now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like they with like the quality with Abercrombie, like the quality, especially right. just that. Yeah, it like it lasts forever. Okay, yeah, that's oh, makeup. I had it on yesterday, but a little um, like it's like really stretchy little shirt. I'm gonna wear black tights, and then I have like just a pair of black heels. Ooh, okay, okay. This is a nice exclusive we Valentine's got... Day, black on black. Okay, okay, bet. <laughs> um, all right. So as this off star ring coming up, when this episode drops, it'll be the Monday after everybody's kind of decompressed from the, the, the all star weekend hangover. So give us your favorite all star weekend memory or story. Um, when Ja had his Mount 12 ski at all star last year in Utah. Mount 12 ski. What's that? Can you enlighten us? Uh, he came out with his jaw one, like his signature shoe and they unveiled like this. It was this big mountain made out of snow in the shape of a bear with like a jaws 12 chain. And it was just really cool. It was cool to like see him unveil his signature shoe. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 So the last question we always ask all of our guests is who should we have next on the what's in your bag podcast? And whoever you say, you got to get back to your hooping days and get in your point guard bag and help us get them on the show. Um, I think you should have Ashley Shamadi. Mm, okay, okay. Have you had her before? Never have. Never have. I have, yeah. I have. You talked to her already? No, I haven't talked to her before. I'm saying I know who that is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think yeah. you should have Ashley Shamadi. So we can make that happen. We can make that happen. Yeah. I think that's what you got to do next. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll be in touch after this to uh, hopefully make that happen. You can give us, give us the assist on that one. Um, but Perfect. I think I had four assists my entire career, but I'll try. I, I, I read something that was like you, you were a corner specialist. Yeah. I just, I just sat there. I didn't pass. I just. Hey, listen, the, the game is about buckets. You don't need to pass. The game is about buckets. <laughs> oh man. But um, I just want to say thank you for your time, KJ. Um, This was a wonderful conversation. I know I learned a lot. Um, and I know obviously you're, you're super busy with, with your job. So, um, it means a lot to me and Alexis both for you, um, to take your time out of your day to come on the podcast. Um, I'm looking forward to following what is next in your career. Um, even though, like I said, we'll, we'll find it, we'll find out on the way, but, um, looking forward to seeing the Grizzlies getting back to their winning ways soon. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah, just shout out to you for being a, just an awesome person, uh, inspiration to both me and Alexis and somebody that a lot of people I'm sure um, look up to in the industry so we, we thank you for your time today thank you guys so much it was actually so nice to meet both of you thank you thank you um well i know we'll, we'll be in touch i know I'll, I'll see you somewhere down the road you know so I definitely look forward to that but um all right guys this has been another episode of the what's in your bag podcast presented by bet online as always remember to like subscribe comment share tell a friend to tell a friend that goes a long long way this is been another episode of What's In Your Bag podcast presented by Bet Online. Until next time, folks. Peace. Suave. 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 I've been in my bag for a while, I'm invincible Story of a young boss, grinding shit critical Calling on my bros one time, cause you special I had some hood dreams and right rounds for my mentor Every target that I shoot is on point like a pencil Different route, change relationships, I'm so sorry Came up from the trenches and I made it, I say hardly now